All right, let's pray together. Could somebody please lead us in prayer? And then we get started. Go ahead. Praise, praise God. Praise God, Enoch. Go ahead. Father, we want to say thank you this morning because you are the Almighty. You are the Alpha and the Omega of our lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you for what you have done throughout yesterday. Thank you for today and thank you for tomorrow in advance. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, because we assemble here once again. Be thou glorified in the mighty name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. The Almighty God, we thank you for the life of our lecturers. Father, we thank you for the strength, your strength over their lives. Be thou glorified in the name of Jesus. The Almighty God will set today lecture into your hands. Because I know whatever thing committed into your hands is secured and mm -hmm. safe. Mm -hmm. We commit today's lecture into your Hebrew and soul of Father. Breathe on our brains, on our minds, in the name of Jesus. And I decree today, O oh Lord, shall be for signs and wonders in our lecture. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Father, we thank you. Because you are there with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good morning once again. So we are in this course, BC 106, Interpreting Scripture. Um, just to quickly review a few things, our goal in this course is to um, learn how to correctly study, understand, interpret and apply uh, the scriptures. So that's what we're doing in this course. Uh, but before we get into the actual, uh, um, the rules of interpretation, so to speak, or how to correctly interpret scripture, we are um, uh, reviewing uh, a very, very uh, important part of it, uh, important aspect, which is the place the scriptures have in our lives, the word of God. The, script, the place the Word of God has in our lives and how to have the Word of God produce in our lives. Um, because our goal is not to just um, intellectually understand Scripture. Uh, of course, we have to use our minds to correctly interpret Scripture. But our goal is to let the Word of God change our lives. The Word of God produce in our lives. And for that, uh, we, were, we started reviewing or going through uh, uh, the book, God's Word, The Miracle Seed. Um, I'll just quickly review the things we covered last week, and then hopefully we'll finish this in this hour, or uh, we'll try to, and then get into uh, the uh, other aspects. So we said that God's Word, I'm, I'm just uh, quickly reviewing. Let me go ahead and share my screen. So we said this is uh, this PDF has been made available uh, for us in the coursework section, uh, the book God's Word, the Miracle Seed. Uh, so we said that the Word of God is foundation for our faith. Uh, uh, you know, we said even that the incarnate Word, that is Jesus, He Himself lived according to the written Word. He used the written Word. He preached the written Word. He taught the written Word that he had and that's uh, that's very powerful uh, we talked about that uh, the fact that god has chosen through the preaching of the word to save people who believe that even god's saving work comes into people's lives through the ministry of the word uh, we said we believe and we recognize that all of scripture has been given by the inspiration of god and is useful uh, for uh, reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness and the scriptures are our window to God so we uh, get to know God through his word the scriptures are our standard and our patterns we live by the word of God the word of God teaches us how to live life and God's word is final authority in our lives we submit to the authority of God's word and we therefore come under obedience to God's word and God wants his word to be in us Richly, that means the word of God should go from the pages of the book and be written on the tables of our heart. That's what we want to see happen in our lives. And uh, another aspect uh, we we spend time on is the purity and power of the word. Uh, we said that um, you know God's hand was involved in the assembly of the holy scriptures. 
the 66 books. God was involved in directing and uh, bringing all of that together for us. Uh, God has exalted his word above his name. That means God considers his word higher than his name or esteems it higher than his own name. You know, so that's, that's how important the word of God is to God. Um, and God's word is as strong as his character. He's backing it up with all of himself. And so the word of God is completely trustworthy, reliable, and dependable. His words are pure words. Um, and uh, the word of God is a carrier of the very power of God. So God's word brings the very power of God into our lives. So we recognize that. And therefore, we build our entire lives on the word of God. We rest upon it. We stand upon his word and we rely on it. But then the big question is, you know, how do we get the word of God to release its power in our lives? What, what, how do we let the word produce in our lives and bring about change in our lives? And so for that, we said we're going to look at the parable of the sower. And um, are we... We began this last last class last week. Uh, Jesus gave us a parable of the sower, which is a parable of the kingdom. And in this parable are hidden the secrets uh, that we can learn on how to have the word of God produce in our lives. And he used this um, a very simple analogy or comparison of the farmer and the seed uh, to teach us about the word of God and he clearly stated that the word of God is like the seed, the sower sows the word. So we said, you know, we could, uh, uh, you know, if you want to outline that whole parable uh, from the three gospels. So he, we see the parable in Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8. If you want to outline that parable, we can put it in, you know, maybe these seven statements uh, that God's word is like seed. Uh, our heart is the ground. Where the seed of the word is to be sown. Uh, the seed must be protected and nurtured if it has to produce. And we must uh, understand the word so that Satan will not be able to take the word away from us, number four. And number five, uh, we may face hardship and persecution because of the word, but we've got to hold on to that word so it can produce in our lives. And uh, number six, we've got to protect our heart from things that can choke the word, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things and the pleasures of life. And we can say that when we understand, receive and retain the word, it will produce in our lives. So the word is like seed. And Jesus has taught us how, for, how to have the seed produce in our lives. And he's also warned us about things that prevent the seed from producing in our lives and we want to understand that so ultimately in our study of the word of god in our learning of uh, you know how to interpret the scriptures and so on we shouldn't forget that ultimately we are doing it so that the word of god can produce in our lives or uh, when we preach and teach the word of course we want to interpret it correctly and uh, preach it correctly to the people but why are we doing it Ultimately, we want the word of God to produce in the lives of the people we are serving. Uh, and because God is working through his word, the word of God is, is a carrier of the power of God. And he's working through his word. And we want to see his word uh, produce in the lives of the people we are serving. So we began to look at these things, uh, you know, break it down step by step. So the seed is the word of God. So when you think about the word, the scriptures. Think about it like seed. You know. Now, what can we say about seed? Uh, we say that uh, 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 every seed uh, uh, has been designed to produce. You know. So when you have a seed in your hand, uh, whatever tree uh, seed, you know, the seed of whatever plant or tree, it may be very small, and some seeds are so tiny. But inside that seed is everything that's needed for it to grow into a plant or even grow into a big tree, which will produce so much more fruit. So every scripture, every word is like a seed. 
it has it has been designed to produce uh, it has the potential to produce you know so the word of god will produce what it has been sent for so the word that god spoke concerning healing will produce healing the word of god concerning uh Boldness will produce boldness. The word of God concerning confidence will produce confidence in our lives. Uh, the word of God concerning deliverance will bring deliverance in our lives. Every seed will produce after its own kind. The word is like seed. It has within it the potential, the power to produce. And so every scripture, when you when you think about scripture, verses and you know the words of God, think of it like seed. This will produce in my life. If I sow it correctly into my heart, and if I nurture it in my heart, it will produce in my life. The same thing. If we sow that word into the lives of people and we help them nurture it, it will produce in their lives. And every seed will produce after its own kind. So every word concerning what God has spoken will produce exactly that in our lives and in the lives of people. Right? So uh, we also went over this, that the word works effectively in you who believe. Right? Uh, when we receive the word of God correctly, it will work effectively. It depends if you receive the word. So Paul told the Thessalonians, you know, you received the word of God, not as the word of men, but as the word of God, which effectively works in you. So if you receive the word of God correctly, the way it's supposed to be received, it will work effectively. The word effective simply means to put out divine energy effectively, you know? So the word will release divine energy in us if we receive it correctly, you received the word of God. So how we receive the word will, will determine how effectively it works in us. But it's carrying divine energy. It's carrying the very power of God, every seed of the word, every, you know, every chapter, every verse is carrying the word, power of God. And uh, if you receive it, it will work effectively. It will release its power. It will bring about change. It will produce in our life. So that's um, uh, that's something very, very powerful. Right? So let's move forward here. Uh, we, we reached till that point last week, and I'm going to go forward. Uh, let me see if there are any questions so far. Any questions? Everybody's together? Okay. Let's go forward. So uh, we want to learn how to sow the seed into our hearts so that it can produce in our lives. So the Jesus taught us in the parable of the sower that the word must be sown in our hearts. So the heart, that means the spirit of man, uh, is the place where um, uh, the, 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 seed, the, the seed of the word has to be sown. So it's the inner person. It's in our inner person where the seed of the word has to be sown. Or we also said in James, he talks about the implanted word. So the word has to be implanted in us. It's got to uh, take root in us. You know, it's like the word implanted has the idea of a seed rooting itself and growing into the ground. That's the word implanted. So James is saying, you know, with humility, you receive the implanted word and then it will save you. It will do something in you, right? So the seed of the word has to be implanted in our hearts. Then it's going to produce uh, in our lives. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the emphasizing yeah, in our heart, you know, God says in Proverbs 4, 20 to 23, says, my son, I want you to pay attention to my words, my sayings. Keep, don't let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. So what does God want? He wants his words 
and his sayings to be alive in our heart. Keep them in the midst of your heart. You know, so he's saying, you know, you take these bag of seeds and sow them into your heart. You know, keep my word in your heart. Why? Because he says, from there, it's life. You know, it's life. God is saying my word, my words, my sayings. You know, it is life. Um, my sayings. It says, keep them in the midst of your heart. It's life and it's health. You know, so the word of God is will release life. It will release healing. And out of there, out of your heart, come the issues of life or the forces that shape your life. You know, so out of our heart come the forces that actually shape our life. And so God is saying, you put my word in your heart because from your heart are the forces that shape your life. And imagine if we have his word in our heart, then his word is releasing the power of God to shape our lives. So the question is, how do I get the word of God into my heart? How do I keep his word in my heart? You know, what, is, uh, what has God taught us? You know, what has he got taught us? Uh, uh, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, and this passage is one repeated for us in the New Testament. So uh, uh, Paul quotes this passage in Romans 10, but it's from the Old Testament. He tells his people, he says, you know, the commandment, that means the word I've given you, it's not far away. It's not somewhere in heaven that you should say, who's going to get it for me? It's not way beyond the sea, who's, who's going to go and get it? But he says, the word is very near you. The word is very near you. Where is it? In your mouth and in your heart. In your mouth, in your heart, so that you may do it. Okay. So, God in the Old Testament, gave a very simple instruction to his people. He said, you know, the word, keep it in your mouth, keep it in your heart. Then you'll be able to follow it. You'll be able to live by it. So we have our Bibles, the word of God. But this Bible, this word of God, God says it has to be in you in two places. It has to be in your mouth. It has to be in your heart. And the Apostle Paul quotes this passage in Romans 10, verse 6 through 8. And he says, the word has to be in our mouth and in our heart. And he explains what it means. He says, but the heart man believes with the mouth confession is made. So to understand this further, God's word is in our heart. We must believe it. It's in our mouth. We must say it. He must speak it. So God wants his word to be operating in our lives like that. Keep it in your heart. Keep it in your mouth. Keep it in your heart. Keep it in your mouth. Keep it in your heart. Believe it. Keep it in your mouth. Say it. Then you're going to be living by this word. And this word will bless your life. So how do we get God's word into our heart? most important thing that I really want us to learn is the process of meditation. Through meditation, we are able to get the word of God into our hearts. And we see meditation in the word of God. Right? God taught his people how to meditate in his word. Right? And he taught them what to do, how to meditate, how to put it into their hearts. So that's what we focus on in the next chapter. And this is one of the main, one of the key things I want you to take away from uh, this part of the course. That is, for all of us as people, as believers, we must practice meditating in God's word. Right? Now, 
uh, when we talk about meditation, we are not talking about some mystical practice, you know, that people do up in the mountains. No, no, no. We're talking about biblical meditation. Right? So we find that in the Bible. It's, it's a discipline in the Bible. Example, you know, Isaac, he went out to meditate in the field. So what would he be doing? So you notice he went out in a quiet, solitary place by himself so that he could focus his thoughts on, obviously, on God and what God had spoken to his family, to Abraham and Isaac. You know, so part of our meditation is to go to a place where we can focus. Now, it might be sitting at your desk. So this very desk that I'm speaking to you from is the place where I meditate. More, almost all the time, you know, I, would, uh, this is, I sit here with my Bible and I meditate in the Word of God. Right? So this is a very quiet place and I can meditate here. Right? Now, God taught meditation, his people. For example, he told Joshua, I want this book of the law. He's talking about the scriptures he had given to them at that time. He said, you meditate in it day and night. You know, you meditate in the word of God day and night. That means, you know, as much time as you can, whenever you can, meditate in my word day and night. Then what will happen is you will follow the word because the word is in your heart becomes in your mouth. Then you will start doing it. And when you do it, you will make your way prosperous. You will have good success. That means, obviously, if you're living by the word of God, you'll be blessed in all your deeds. You'll be blessed in all your ways. And you'll make your way prosperous. You'll have good success. So God was telling Joshua, meditate in my word. Right? Uh, another, uh, 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 so, or some other, uh, scriptures, he says, uh, you know, that there's no nation here that who has the word of God, who calls upon him, uh, and who's, you know, who has been given his word, and he tells them, this, this word must be laid up in your heart and in your soul. You know, he's telling them, look, I've given you my word, but I want your word to be put into your heart and into your soul. Right? So, how do we... Uh, break down the process of meditation. Uh, and we know also Psalm 1 verse 2, you know, his, this man, he delights in the law of God and in his law he meditates day and night. That means he's constantly meditating in the word, right? So let's, how do we break it down, right? And there are several scriptures on meditation here that I've listed. Now, when the Hebrews practice meditation. And if you look at the meaning of that word meditation, it means to reflect, to imagine, to ponder. It also means with it to moan, growl, mutter, murmur, to make a quiet sound, to contemplate something as one repeats the words. There is another Hebrew word, siyak, used in Psalm 119. It means to ponder, to talk to oneself, to commune with oneself, to declare, to pray, to talk. It's all these words. All these me words mean from Siak. So in meditation, what the Jewish person would do is he would sit in a very quiet place and uh, he would, you know, maybe put his prayer shawl so that he covers off all the distractions, uh, you know, uh, and then he would go back and forth and he would recite the scriptures, recite the scriptures. His eyes are closed, his mind, his thoughts, his imagination is on the scriptures, which he's reciting, which he is saying, and he's meditating. Example, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not be in want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So while he is reciting, his thoughts and his imaginations are focused on those scriptures, on that word. And he's meditating. You know, he's, he's pondering, he's thinking, he's imagining what those scriptures are meaning as he's speaking. He's meditating. And he may go over that psalm once, twice, thrice. He may pray about it to God. Oh God, you are my shepherd. You are the one who provides for all my needs. Oh God, you're the one who leads me by the green past, leads me to the green past. So he's engaging with the scriptures. He's thinking about it, imagining it, reciting it, praying it. And through that meditation, the word of God is in your heart, in your mouth, in your heart, in your mouth. The word of God becomes a part of you. So, if we want to put it in simple words, you know, just for our uh, explanation's sake, we can break it down into three words. Contemplation, visualization, confession, or recitation. I won't use whatever word you like. So, meditation involves contemplation. You're thinking within yourself. You know? So the psalmist said, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse, meaning I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm pondering, I'm remembering, I'm meditating. See those words? So I'm, I'm, I'm remembering, I'm musing, I'm thinking on your words, on your works, on what you've done, contemplation. You know, so, uh, you know, for example, if you're meditating on healing scriptures, so you want to sow the seeds of healing into your heart. If you want healing, what must you do? You sow healing, seeds of healing. And so, example, if you want tomatoes, you sow tomato fruit, uh, sow seeds if you want tomatoes. Uh, if you want, uh, you know, you want... Uh, uh, Chilies, you put green chili seeds, you'll get chilies, you know, whatever. So you're sowing the seed for a particular harvest. So if we want healing in our bodies or in our minds, we sow the seed of God, the word of God concerning healing. So you take the healing scriptures and you meditate in it. Right? So you, you could start example in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, God says, None of these diseases will come on you because I am the Lord who heals you. So you just meditate on it. Exodus 23, 24 and 25. You will serve the Lord your God and he will bless your bread and your water and he will take all sickness away from your midst. And then he says there will be no one who will be barren or suffer miscarriage in your land and the number of your days I will fulfill. You know, Deuteronomy 7, verse 15, I will take sickness away from your midst. So like this, you can keep going through the scriptures and just meditate in it. God, this is what you said. Thank you, God. You are the God who takes all sickness away from my midst. You know, your word is health to my body. It's nourishment to my bones. Proverbs 3, you know, 7 through 9, he says, Lord, the fear of the Lord is health to my body. It's nourishment to my bones. My bones are strengthened. Then, you know, you continue to go through the scriptures like that. You meditate in it. You're thinking deeply on those scriptures. And many times during the process of contemplation, you receive revelation. That means the Holy Spirit 
will take you into new realms of understanding. So, ah, I've never seen that before. I've read that same verse many times, but now I'm seeing something. What's happening? During contemplation, you receive revelation. You see something you've not seen before. Oh God, thank you. you know, so when you're contemplating, the Holy Spirit will take you into new areas in that scripture. So, oh, look at this. Because he's the one who inspired it. Now he is illuminating it. He's sh shedding light on it. He was the one who gave the inspiration. Now he's giving you illumination. That, that gives you revelation. Oh, I didn't see that before. But when does that happen? Illumination usually happens during contemplation. When you're contemplating on the scriptures, the Holy Spirit gives you an illumination. He opens your eyes to see what you've not seen. We call it revelation. It's happening. You know, the same Holy Spirit who inspired the scriptures is now illuminating it for you and me. Right? So during contemplation, that happens. You get revelation. Okay? And also during contemplation, our mind is renewed by the word. Now, our thinking begins to change because now our mind is focused on the scriptures. It starts, it's being trained to think according to the scriptures. So the next time when something happens, your mind automatically thinks in line with the word of God. So contemplation is powerful. It's part of the meditation process. It helps get the word of God into your heart. It positions you for revelation or ill illumination revelation. It also renews our mind to the word of God. Contemplation influences our thinking. Okay, so this is part of meditation. You're contemplating on the word. I'll explain the next two steps and then we will take questions. So along with contemplation, another part of meditation is visualization. Visualization means you're imagining. You are seeing with your mind's eye the word of God being fulfilled. So God gave us our imagination. You know, he created the ability of our mind to envision, to imagine, to paint pictures, to see things. He gave us that ability. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Now, people misuse their imagination for foolish things, but we don't have to. We can use our imagination for good things. Now, one uh, simple example is in Genesis 15, uh, verses 1 through 6, where, uh, you know, Abraham has been given the promise from God that he's going to be the father of a big nation. And uh, at that moment, uh, you know, this is about... Uh, you know, almost 15 years later, uh, Abraham is saying, Lord, you know, I still don't have a child. Uh, does it mean that somebody born in my house will be my child, will be this descendant? And then uh, God says, Abraham, look toward the heaven and count the stars. So you can imagine, you know, it must have been at night time. Abraham looks into the night sky. It's all dark. But he looks into the heaven, he sees stars, he sees all the stars, so many. And God says, so shall your descendants be. So God was painting a picture in Abraham's mind or imagination of the fulfillment of his promise. Look at the stars. That's how many descendants you're going to have. You are going to have. Somebody was coming from your own body. From your own body. That's how many. That's the fulfillment of, your, of, your, of my promise. And from that day on, we can be certain that in Abraham's imagination, he never forgot the night sky. Every time he thought about the promise of God, he will imagine the stars in the sky. That's what God said. So shall your descendants be. And it says, he believed in the Lord. So, you know, it helped him. It helped him 
looked to God. He believed in the Lord. So that imagination, painting on the canvas of your imagination is so powerful. It happens during meditation. So as you're meditating the word, you begin to see yourself in the word and the word fulfilled in your life. Whatever the word is saying, it's fulfilled. You see it happen in your life. The, uh, with, you know, with your, just like for Abraham, see this happen. Right? So visualization, you're seeing with your imagination the word of God being fulfilled right and th there are many other examples that we can point to you know how when the spies 12 spies went to the promised land to spy out the land you know there 10 of them came back with this imagination you know we are like grasshoppers but the others said you know they are bread for us you know uh, they are like bread we can eat them up that's Joshua and Caleb. They said, they are bread for us. You know, we can go and conquer them. So they had a different picture in their minds of what their enemies looked like. You know, so their imagination was so important. The last part of meditation is confession. That is, the word must be in your mouth. You're reciting it. You are speaking it. Right? So your contemplation, visualization, confession, you're saying the word. And as we go through this process of meditation, right, it becomes a part, the word of God gets into our spirit. The word is sown into our hearts. So the word of God is like seed. It must be sown in our hearts. How do we sow it? To the process of meditation. We contemplate, visualize, and confess. And that word is sown into our hearts. Right? So I want to encourage you, just before I close off this sec section, you know, many times, many times when we are meditating in the word, we, are, we actually encounter and commune with God. It's a very powerful thing. Right? That, that when we meditate, we are communing with God, we are encountering God. That's what the psalmist, you know, Psalm 63, he says, I meditate on you. Now, he longs for God. He is desiring for God. He's thirsty for God. He wants to encounter God. What does he do in order to, you know, encounter God? He meditates. He meditates. You know? So meditation leads us into that encounter with God. And so much of revelation just begins to pour into our lives. And, um, you know, like we said, uh, the meditation, God's word, it really transforms our mind. Our strongholds are pulled down. Things in our mind that shouldn't be there are uh, discarded. And our mind is renewed um, as we meditate in the word of God. It's a very important uh, uh, part of our Christian life. Okay. Now, uh, the fruits of meditation, they, they cause us to prosper. Meditating the word will bring us to a place where whatever we do will prosper. God promised that in his word, uh, that uh, because we start walking according to the word, his word will produce in our lives and will prosper. Now, how do you develop the discipline of meditation? One is start to do it every day. On a daily basis, keep some time to meditate in the word. Then there will be times of special need. So maybe you're going through some challenges, you know, difficulties. Uh, so here the psalmist says, you know, I'm fa he's facing people who are against him, but he goes to the word. And during that time, he, he says, I will meditate on your precepts. So he's going through difficult times. People are speaking against him, but he is meditating on the word of God. So there are times of meditation. Then you do it as a purposeful exercise. And that means you intentionally, you keep time aside to meditate. The psalmist said, you know, I'm staying awake in the night because I want to meditate on your word. So intentionally is meditating on the word. Now, there are many, uh, you know, different ways you can 
incorporate meditation into your daily life. Um, what are some of the ideas that I use is, uh, you know, I, I, uh, in my mind, I, I, I have like word seeds and I've given it towards the end of this book where on different topics, I have certain scriptures. And so I meditate on those topics. So it's more like for healing, here are all the scriptures. For courage or boldness, here are all the scriptures. For anointing, here are the scriptures. You know, and then I meditate. If I want to meditate on a certain topic, I meditate. I go to those verses and I meditate. So it's like word seeds. I'm putting those seeds in my heart in order to experience a certain harvest. Another thing that uh, I used to do, especially in my early days, is I set aside certain days uh, to meditate on certain topics. So every Sunday, I will meditate on certain scriptures on prayer and generosity, Monday on faith, Tuesday on divine health, Wednesday on family, scriptures on the family, Thursdays I would meditate on, on wisdom and understanding, Fridays on success and prosperity, and Saturdays on ministry and miracles. So, I used to do that. I don't follow this timetable now, but I used to, especially for, you know, the early years for about five, six years, I used to follow, uh, or, or much longer. I used to follow this kind of a timetable. Now I don't follow a timetable. I keep it more spontaneous. That is, on, I, I do more of uh, this type, you know, word seeds meditation, meaning I just go to a topic that I feel like I need to at that moment, and I just meditate in the scriptures on that topic uh, anytime, any day, uh, I just do it. Another last part of uh, uh, meditation is contemplative Bible reading. And I will explain this to you uh, when we get into um, another chapter where um, you take a passage and you just contemplate on it. So you're not rushing through it in a hurry, you're contemplating, meditating. Uh, looking at the scriptures, what's happening is that passage is getting into your heart. So I call it contemplative Bible reading. Okay. And you're meditating in that passage. Sometimes I may be on the same passage for many days uh, and uh, I'm in no hurry because that word is getting into my heart. God is speaking. Revelation is coming. So as long as that is happening, I just stay with that passage. Right? You may spend 30 minutes, one hour, doesn't matter. You're contemplating on that passage. And uh, uh, many re much revelation comes through this process of contemplative Bible reading. I remember, I just shared one personal testimony here. Uh, I remember you know, in September, uh, I spent uh, about four days on just one verse, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. It just said, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's it. Mark 1, verse 1. And I couldn't get past that. And I would open, come in the morning, read Mark 1, verse 1, and I'd just be on it for about 30 minutes and more. You know, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and revelation would just be pouring in. You know, and uh, I preached that sermon during Christmas 2019. It was like, you know, during that time of meditation, and this that one verse, Mark 1, verse 1, uh, over a four-day period, uh, just going from the very big, you know, from eternity past all the way to where Jesus is today, the exalted eternal word. You know, just, just that whole revelation, that whole understanding which is being poured into my heart. And uh, so uh, medit contemplative Bible reading, uh, meditation is very, very powerful, right? So I'm going to stop here. I know I've kind of very quickly uh, tried to explain to us the process of meditation, uh, but this is very, very powerful. I uh, just want to ask, uh, do you have any questions, any thoughts on this uh, 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 in that? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, that, so uh, in, in Matthew, there's a question here from John. In the power of the server, uh, in Matthew 13, 21, Jesus said that the, you know, there's no, this, he has no root in himself, right? But endures only for a while. So that means 
uh, what does it mean uh, to have root in him? So that means the seed didn't get implanted in his heart. And so if you compare it with the other parables, what happens, uh, you know, uh, Mark 4 explains, right, that uh, when the seed goes in, it's the roots start coming out, but the stones around it prevent the roots from actually getting into the soil. And explains the stones are persecutions and hardships, tribulation that come for the word's sake. You know, so what's happening is he's hearing the word, he's receiving, he hears the word, but then he faces difficulty, he gives up on the word. So the word doesn't take root in his life. It doesn't get implanted in his heart. And then if, you know, if the seed doesn't get implanted and the roots don't go into the soil, it's not going to be able to bear fruit. So that's what he's talking about in uh, Matthew 13, 21. So if you want to look at it in a positive way, the word has to get its roots deep into our heart. Okay. Um, so is the process of meditation clear uh, and, and how you can practice this? Is it, is it kind of clear? I've also given some practical ideas. Is that something uh, you, you may, you've understood and you can do? Okay. All right. Um, I hope uh, all of you have understood it. Uh, uh, and I've gone through it very quickly, but I would say this is one of the most important disciplines you and I can have uh, as believers, you know, meditating in the word of God. And we practice it throughout our lifetime. You know, it's not something we do, you know, once in a way. No, throughout our life, we learn how to meditate in the word of God. Okay. So we're going to take a... Uh, break, a 10 minutes break. Uh, we will come back. We will finish the rest of the chapters very quickly, the parable of the Sova. We'll finish it very quick. Then we will get into uh, the next chapter, which I've shared on the uh, in the coursework uh, section. It's about, okay, we're starting to get into the course on interpreting scripture. So that's our goal after we come back from the break. Right. So let's take a 10 minute break. I'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.